Stand by to launch fan stream sports. Three, two, one. Let's start. Hello, sports fans. Welcome to Fan Stream Sports. Nothing. Nothing but pure sports. This is the JP Show. JP, it is so good to hear you back on the air. Stand by. Now, here's JP. All right, welcome into a Monday edition of the JP Peterson Show here. Along with Nick Geddes. Good morning to you, Nick, from On3 Sports. How are you, my friend? I am doing great. Uh, this was a, a great sports weekend we just came off of. Just because there's no football doesn't mean that there's not plenty to watch. And we got so much, I feel like, to get into. Like, we fit like a week's worth of news, I feel like, into two days. Yes. Yeah, it works on like, the, what, do, what do we lead weekend. with? What do we lead with? There's so In much the, to talk about. I was going to say, though, I, I just missed you barely on Saturday. Um you know me, I usually don't do the events in the area. No. But you're not I found interview. myself I found myself at the St. Patrick's uh extravaganza, whatever oh, you call it. There, the Curtis the Hickson. River O'Green Festival. I was oh, there you sure. go. The River O'Green Festival. I yes. found myself there. Uh was there for about an hour maybe, got crowded mm. and left. And then I go on social media and you were in the process of just getting ready to start off the parade. That's right. And I didn't realize I walked right by you. Didn't yeah. even I, I you didn't walked even right like, by. I didn't even say hello. How about I that? I didn't even like I wasn't even like I was just focused on getting to the car. Didn't even notice right. you. And then I was like, are you kidding me? We were right there. Yeah, I just locked downtown. Yeah, it was crazy. I think it was about 100,000 people on the parade. Route. A lot of people. Yeah. For the first time ever, the Rough Riders uh, moved their St. Patty's Day parade from Ebor to downtown Tampa in conjunction with the River Green Fest. And uh, it was a big hit. Huge, huge hit. We had all the. You know, very similar to the Gasparilla par- uh, Parade with all the big floats and bands and all that stuff. Fantastic turnout. Beautiful day. Of course, they had the, the festival down there with the turning of the River Green, all the bands and everything. It was very nice. It's a great day. Beautiful day in, in, uh, in, Tampa, in Tampa Bay. Lots of those reggae festival going on. Boy, it was popping. It's a springtime, right? Springtime is is huge here in uh, Tampa Bay. And we got Valspar this week. This is Valspar week has officially started. So we'll be out there on uh, Thursday and Friday. And we'll be live out there. Uh, Ronnie Barber will join us. We'll hopefully get some of the golfers out there. What a finish to the players. We got to talk about that. Uh, and we got Sal Palantonio on today. Let me set up the show for the folks. Sal Pal joins us at 1030. Um, we're going to talk some Devin White to the Eagles, even though we talked a little bit about that Friday. We didn't really get into it too much uh, as that came down. So Sal Powell will join us at 1030. Jim Lighthall, play-by-play man for USF, who was there in Fort Worth this weekend for the ill-fated tournament that left USF with a trip to UCF on Tuesday night in the NIT. I mean, you want to talk about Getting the booby prize door. What's behind door number three? Wah, 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 wah. That just is so wrong on so many levels. To send them to Orlando to play a 17 and 15 UCF team. We're a big 12 juggernaut. I don't know what you're, what you're scoffing at over there. Big 12 well, juggernaut UCF Knights. Well, the only tournament team that the, Bulls beat this year was FAU because their schedule was just very, very light. It was light. And they lost right. some early games when they weren't really a team yet. They were still trying to figure out who they are and what they are. Um, it, it's kind of a tough process when, you know, for these mid majors, right? Um, first year coach, that's why it's so damn hard to do it. It's so damn hard to do it. What they accomplished was phenomenal. And I think not making the tournament is an injustice. There's no question about that. But, um, you know, when you look at the overall system in basketball, it's about as good as you can get it. You know, it's much better than the football one, in my opinion. But isn't it interesting that two teams with very good regular seasons, historic regular seasons, like FSU and football and USF and basketball, are on the outside looking in. And that kind of sucks. And it sucks for USF. Uh, Jim Lighthall will join us at 11.15 and we'll get the whole – you know, feeling for what it was like this weekend. The game that they played against UAB was evidently, I did not see much of the game. It was a slugfest. And they they just turned it into, you know, they mucked it up. UAB did. And that worked. And USF just couldn't come back from the deficit. Also, Bob Herrick's going to join us, uh, golf uh, golf writer for Sports Illustrated, senior golf writer. He has a new book out on Tiger, which is fantastic. 
So we'll talk about that. And of course, the Players Championship. Wow. I watched the whole thing yesterday. Watched uh, just yesterday was a rest day for me, bro. I had to, I was not, I've been running so freaking hard. I laid my ass in bed and watched the entire players. And I'm proud of it. I'm that, damn proud of it. I mean, isn't every that's my goal one day? I want to mm. be, I want to be up to that point at, at some point where I could just lay in bed and just watch one sport yeah. wire to wire. And it was, you know, and it's, it's great theater. You know, it's the best golf theater uh, for my money. Look, I mean, the Masters is the best golf theater. Let me check that. I'm talking in terms of venue and being able to watch it uh, from a stadium standpoint, you know, 16, 17, 18. Um, that's, that, that's just unmatched in golf. Uh, obviously, the Masters is at, at another level. I mean, we'll, you know, but uh, these finishing holes are just tremendous. And the way, you know, with 17 and 16, the chance to make eagle, and it all came into play on 17, 16, 17, and 18. So, you know, Scotty Scheffler, and watching him play T to green yesterday, I cannot remember a shot that he missed. Let me say that again. I don't remember a shot that he missed. Maybe on 16, his second shot on the par five, he puts it in a bunker left. And then, of course, it's a brilliant bunker shot. With, the, with water, the green running away from him, and water on the other side, uh, needing a birdie to take the lead, he hits just an absolutely fabulous bunker shot to make birdie and take the lead and finish it off. I mean, what a finish by Scotty Shepard. The His ball striking, you know, you, you go back to 2000 Tiger Woods. I mean, that's that's the last time we saw ball striking like this. And, you know, he's not the greatest putter in the world, but he found, you know, he's found a mallet putter that, that, that could make him at least average. And he... Runs away with the Arnold Palmer last week and then wins the players this week. Back-to-back -back wins on tour, very rare. And now back-to-back, -back, well, defending the players' championship, which has never been done before in 50 years. So uh, Scotty Scheffler is just on another level right now. And that was a virtuoso performance yesterday. So Bob Herrig will join us at 11.30. We'll talk about his book and the players' championship. And by the way, and I, I'll be interested to get his thoughts on this, You know, to me – Brian Harmon, Xander Schauffele, both who will be uh, at at uh, Valspar this week. By the way, I thought they I thought they played very timidly on the back nine. I thought they did not let it rip. They weren't as confident as Scotty Scheffler was. And when you're playing at that level against those guys, if you don't play with the utmost confidence and be aggressive in the spots where you could be aggressive, and sometimes in spots where maybe you shouldn't, you got to push the the, the, the hammer down and uh, just off the top of my head, shot laid Eagle putt on 16 coming up short. Hot. That's a no go. You can't be short there. He had two great shots at 16. Then he, he, he comes up short on his putt. Um, even on 18, he bails his drive out to the right. Uh, and, and which leaves him, you know, eventually leaves him a 60 footer for birdie to, to try and get into the playoff. No way he's going to make that. So, and I also thought that at, at other points, um, now Brian Harmon, his second shot at 16, he drove, drives it into the pine straw. Now he's got an opening where he can move it up the fairway and he's very, you know, hit it, left himself 156 out when he could have probably got it closer down to the green, but he was afraid of going into the water on the right. I get it. But, and then and he comes up one short. And then at the end, of course, the lip out, uh, for Wyndham Clark. <laughs> oh my oh. God. What a cruel game. He was he was aggressive on 17 and 18. Hits a great shot on 17, as did Xander. Finally, he he trusted himself and hit hit the, the sand wedge right where he needed to hit it. And then, you know, I thought he babied his putt on 17. I thought I thought Xander, you know, he tried to lag it in instead of taking the break out of it and just knocking it in the freaking back of the hole. Yes, if it doesn't go in, you gotta you got a tester coming back. But again, at this level. Take the break out of it, knock it in the freaking hole, and he didn't do it. Um, so I'll be interested to hear what Bob has to say about how these guys played down the stretch. Because I got news for you: you ain't beating Scotty Scheffler unless you're being aggressive and making your shots as well. He's too freaking good right now. And I will also say, Nick, as I looked at that leaderboard, it's about as good as it can get on the PGA Tour. You know, minus Rory. I said, you know, there's some big names here, but there's a lot of big names that aren't on there. Well, there's a lot. The big names are kind of missing, but don't get it twisted. I mean, Scheffler, Wyndham Clark, Xander Shoffley, Brian Harmon, 
Uh, and then the whole Matt Fitzpatrick, who's now... Re- Look, did you just hear about that whole thing? The whole thing with the weighted driver or whatever? He didn't realize there was a weight in his driver all last year. And then he just figured it out, like, right before the players. And every- and he was like, oh, my gosh, my swing feels better. Because remember, he struggled last year? Yeah. It was, like, the weirdest thing. And Fitzpatrick Somebody goes out and puts up a... Driver? Yeah, he had, like, a little weight, like, in his driver. And he was doing it as a, a testing thing last year. Didn't realize they never took it out. And so he played all tour last year with it on. And then he comes out here at the players, realizes that the weight was there, takes it out, and then now he's, you know, 16 under yesterday, tied for fifth. Um, But my point is, it's like, that's still a really good top five leaderboard when you think about it. And you can even throw Matsuyama in there, who's been playing some great golf. Yeah. yeah. Like, maybe they're not the biggest names necessarily. I mean, Scheffler obviously is. Like, he's the undisputed best player in golf. Yep. There's, I don't want to hear anything about, you know, Joaquin Neiman, John Rom. as far as I'm concerned, he's not even in the running anymore because he's not playing in this type of competition. And that's just Dead the cold Dead hard fact me. of that. <laughs> uh, but but he's still the, the best undisputed. player. Yeah, yeah, and it's a shame that he's not here to, to, to show it, though. Imagine right. if John Rom was plopped into that leaderboard yesterday. Yeah. That, that's a disservice to golf, but Scheffler Players took champion. that tournament. And yeah. Wyndham, Clark's, Wyndham Clark, for me, is the second best player on the PGA Tour right now. It's Scheffler and Wyndham yeah. Clark. This yeah. is two weeks in a row. They've gone back-to-back, one-two finishes. But, Don't know the last time that's happened. But I think that um, shows the lack of depth at the top. I think that shows lack of depth at the top, and I don't think it's any, any – and I don't mean to diminish what Scotty Scheffler did, but do you think the fact that live golf exists and these guys can't play – is one of the big reasons that he's the first to ever go back to back. Come on, not now. necessarily. Because come on now. Listen, when when you John go Rom, back to, two years Johnson. ago, two years ago before Liv even existed, Scotty Scheffler went on that run where we were talking. Okay, is he going to have a Tiger like season? Eased up a little bit late in 2022, but winning four events in the first three months of 2022, including the Masters, that was with all the best players on the tour. And now Scotty obviously has learned how to putt again. And that makes him dominant. He could win any week if he wants to. He's the only true, consistent, like, tournament-to-tournament golfer that's on the tour. I think that says more about today's player, JP, is that you don't have the consistency from certain players. Like, every week, you don't know what you're going to get out of a Jordan Speed. You don't know what you're going to get out of a Justin Thomas and some of these great players. You always know what you're going to get out of Scott, Scotty Scheffler, and that's what makes him the undisputed number one player in the entire world. Uh, going on the live uh, leaderboard, and the first thing they show you are the teams. I don't give a rat's ass about the teams. <laughs> Nobody cares about your teams. <laughs> Ooh, we're going to have people buying the teams as franchises for hundreds of millions of dollars. No. Um, looking at the their their last leaderboard. <laughs> but, but still, these are the guys that aren't out there on the PGA Tour that would have been in your players' leaderboard. Kepka, Johnson, Dustin Johnson, John Rahm, Stenson, Chambo, Joaquin Neiman. I mean, the, is it the same winning a player's championship, a player's championship when those guys aren't in the field? No, no. When you take half the top 20 and you take them out, how can you say it's as difficult the year to year? You can't. You can't say it. And this will be an interesting question for Bob Herrick, who's one of the leading historians in the game. When we look back on this era, and of course there's news that the PGA Tour and Live Golf are coming together. There's you know, there's new, um, uh, new negotiations now going on. Bob will sort it all out for us. I'm not up to date on all that, but it looks like they're getting closer to coming there, together. There's a, there's a meeting taking place, I yeah. guess, in the Bahamas, and Tiger is supposed to be, a, is supposed to be there. Well, Maybe that's why he's not at Valspar this week. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, so when we look back on this era, if they come together, this two-year era, and say, oh, you know, asterisk, asterisk, this is this is when the, you know, the fields weren't full of the top players. I think we might. From a history standpoint, we have to. We have to. I'm not trying to diminish what Scotty did, but – I, I don't think it's a coincidence that for the first time in 50 years, we have a repeated repeat champion at the players and half the, the top 20 is not playing. I think that's fair. I get, I, I just think we it's, I on. just think whoever's in the field, I don't think anybody can hold a candle to Scotty Scheffler right now. I, that's just how I feel about it. 
Uh, hard, I haven't hard, watched. Hard the to amount disagree of, with. I, I haven't watched lady. the amount of. I haven't watched the amount of golf that you have watched over a lifetime. So I'm not yeah. going to go out here and make blanket statements like, "Oh, he's in the same category as so and so from you know 30 years ago." But for my time of watching golf, like obviously there's Tiger, and then there's been everybody else. But why can't I say Scotty Scheffler when you compare him to the Dustin Johnsons of the world, the McElroys, the better players of the last mm-hmm. 10, 15 years? Is, am I wrong to say that Scheffler is the most exciting one to watch and just the most like consistent golfer I've seen in this like current generation? I know it's only been like a two to three like span that he's been doing this, but truly, like all he had to do was learn how to be an average putter, and he can do this. And the fact that he entered what yesterday, twelve under, I mean, everybody's like, is he going to be a factor? Is Shot it going to be a factor? Four. Of course he is. And you're talking oh. about how Shoffle and Harmon, you know, seemed a little bit conservative. That's because they knew that Scheffler was coming. And yeah. they, he was nipping right. He had yeah, that but that's ability. all the more reason to be aggressive in my mind. All right, we'll talk more about this with Bob because I'm going to get to some other things in our first half hour here before we get to Sal Pal Antonio. Uh, coming up at 1030, looking forward to talking to him. And by the way, we've been going back and forth about Devin White, you know, <laughs> as he goes to the Eagles. So I'm like, he's like, He's like, yeah, Vic Fangio's gonna find a way to use oh him. My like goodness. Todd Bowles couldn't couldn't reach him, you know, and and, and that's like a father son. So we'll, we'll we'll talk more about that. All right, the Bolts win five three on Saturday night. Now, before we get crazy, that's a seven and up since the new guys got here. That's a seven and up that went over the Flyers, number three in the East in the Metro. 6-3 win over the Rangers after being down 2-0 and 3-2 in the third over the best team in the Metro. And then you go and beat the Panthers 5-3, the best team in the Atlantic, on the road there. So, Julian Brisebois, how are these new guys looking? <laughs> now, that's, so that's six points, you know, where we we, we were hoping for, hoping for four, would take three, you get six. That is if, if, and when the, the lightning make the playoffs, that's the three game stretch right there. That's going to be the difference. Now they got outshot 38 to five <laughs> in the final two periods at Florida, 38 to five. But this is what's good. Is what would we talk about last week? We need Vassy to be Vassy. We need him to return to elite status. There's nothing like getting 50 shots <laughs> to get you on your game. And it's like the more Vass he gets, the better he gets, right? These, this is his kind of game. And boy, did he answer the bell. He they outshot 50 to 16, the biggest disparity in shots in Lightning history. And Vassy steals it as the Lightning win 5 3. What, what, what a night. Yeah, what I night? mean, literally, when I've been when I've been talking about the last couple of weeks, how I don't feel the Lightning are necessarily a Stanley Cup contender, I've been saying it's because I don't think '88 is capable of giving you those type of performances this season. This season, okay, I'm not saying he's cooked or anything like that. I'm just saying this season because he hasn't really shown me that. Right. But there's been select times throughout this season, maybe once a month, you get a Andre Vasilevsky performance like this one. Remember the game against what was it, Boston last month in February up in Boston. And he stole that game, too. Yeah, That yeah. was a game where it went back and forth, and it was all Andre Vasilevsky. Mm-hmm. And then he had some rough area, some rough uh, periods of play, obviously. And then he comes back in this game against Florida. You mentioned it. The Lightning just were in survival mode, you know, all night. I mean, Florida, listen, Florida's, the, my, for my money, they're the best team in the league. I think most people probably agree with that. They're just so dangerous, the way they could beat you, the speed, yeah. the passing. Yeah. Like, it was mesmerizing to watch. Like, let's be honest. Yeah. The Lightning looked like they were they had no business being out there. Credit the Lightning. They took advantage of the chances they got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was a big deal. But Vasilevsky, the way he closed the door, and it was really late in the game. I mean, he made that save with, like, two minutes left. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Do you remember the save that Javi Bulin made in the 4 final in Game 7? Uh, Which one? Like four minutes left. There was a yeah. shot from the side. Yeah. Puck leaks out to the side. I think it was Jordan Leopold, and he got all the way across and made that save, and that mm-hmm. really saved them that game. That save that he made with two minutes left against Florida, it looked like the same exact situation. Yep. Um, and it was just, I have no idea how in the world he got over. I think it was Barkoff or Reinhardt or one of their mm-hmm. top guys, I believe, that was just sitting right there with a wide open net, and Vasilevsky got all the way over. 
that yep. was the vintage Vasilevsky. And then, of course, that led to them going to get the empty netter and, and win the game and hold on. So, you know, can you count on getting a Vasilevsky performance like that in the postseason? That's He's the big capable question. of it. He's clearly capable of it, but that's the level. What you saw the other night, forget about the way the Lightning played because they got to be better in those areas. But just specifically what you saw in net, that is the level that Vasilevsky has to get to if the Lightning have a shot. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, the Lightning are good enough to win a couple of games on their own. Their power play with their five on five, they're good enough. But you're gonna, the Vasi's going to need to steal one and a half, one at least one to one and a half games per series for them to win. And that's typically when they've won the cup, that's typically what he's done, you know, in, in a sense. And, and so this is no different. So, yeah, they got a sure they got a chance as good as anybody with Vassy playing at that level. And, and the big thing about it is the other teams know this. The other teams know this. And this is why, you know, they're, if the if the Lightning get in as the number, you know, as a wild card, whoever they play in the first round does not want to see the Tampa Bay Lightning coming. It's just like, you know, the, the Lightning in Columbus. Uh, we, we've seen these one eight, two sevens. I mean, once you get in, the seedings really don't even matter, right? It's a different, it's a different atmosphere. It's a different sport. And I think, um, you know, what 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 we've seen since these two guys have gotten here. Now, is it a coincidence? No, I don't think it is. I mean, there's no no question Duclair has added some spark to this team. And, and the word is, I'm I'm not in the locker room, but the word is they fit in extremely well. They've given some some energy to the room, which desperately needed, desperately needed. Um, and just giving it a little, you know, loosened it up a little bit. Maybe there was some tightness in there or whatever. They got it done. And so well, these these guys have made a difference. Well, consider consider the the Duclair, because I think he's been like the spark plug to this team over the, ever since he's gotten here. Yeah. Uh, consider this. He's playing on the top line now. Right. With Nikita Kucherov and is it is it Braden Point he's playing with, Point, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um Ever since they put those two to, those three together, yeah. uh, this team has really taken off. And consider that you got a guy that can play on your top line with two out of this world players, and you got him for a third round pick yeah. and a defensive prospect who has been obviously blocked from getting up here in Jack Thompson. Right. Like when we had all these discussions about the deadline, like and people wanted to go big game hunting and stuff yeah. like that, and the Lightning just simply couldn't. These were the deals they needed to make. And look how just marginally better it made the team. Yeah. Yep. Just by adding two players. Because I think Dumba has also played well uh, in this system. He did not play great in Arizona this year before they got him. But he's been pretty good here so far with the Lightning. Short sample size. But Duclair in particular. This is a guy who can score 30 goals in this league. He's done it. Okay. And you got him on this cheap deal and everything. I think he's been fantastic. Uh, Steven Stamkos, who I, I told you had like the worst month of his career yes. in February. He's already, he's already, he's already doubled his point total in March. So, and that's because he, you know, he, you move him down now with Duclair moving up, right? Right. So you have more depth to the top six, top nine, really, and so you know you open up areas for for Stamkos, and he's taking advantage of it, right? So, yeah, it's it affects the entire team all the way down, um, and uh, brilliant moves by Breezebois. It certainly looks at this point. Let's listen in to uh, John Cooper after the game on Saturday night down in Sunrise. Here's Coop. So what did it take for you guys to kind of Courtesy about slow down without, especially given, you know, such a discrepancy in shots? And I, like, I don't know. I don't look at the shot clock. I look at the goal clock. And uh, in the end, it's, you know, we put ourselves in a position in the first, you know, 30 minutes, 25 minutes of that game. Um, you know, the right team was leading the game. So we did everything right to put us in that spot. And then we did everything to give it back to them. And when you're going to take, you know, I don't know how many power play shots they had, but it was probably in the 20s. And if you're going to give a team like that, that many uh, <clears throat> uh, chances with at the extra guy, uh, it can pose to be a problem. And, and uh, but in saying that, you know, there's challenges ahead. Your penalty kill's got to kill it off. Your five on six is going to be solid. And we were put in some tough situations to get ourselves out and protect the lead, and we did it. So you look at those challenges and say, boys, you passed. Now you, is, is that a recipe for success? Like <laughs> long term, no. But we will be in those situations again. We're going to have to kill a penalty off. We're going to have to five on six and get through it. And we did it against a really, really good hockey team. 
And so for me, you know, is it the you know easiest win where you sit in the four nothing lead and just sail into the end of the game? Uh, no, and that's why they have forty plus wins or whatever it is. But you know, we were faced with a lot of challenges, and and we passed. Um, but we know we got better in us and in. in you know, especially the penalties we took and stuff like that uh, to give them life. Uh, but, you know, the uh, the kid in that was unreal. And, hey, listen, we came here to get two points and we got them. Not going to make any, uh, not going to apologize for that. Can you uh, can you tell early on when Vasilevsky, obviously, you know, he's, I mean, but tonight he was amazing, you know. Yeah, he, I, it was, uh, um, you know, it's the Vasi we've seen for a decade, and uh, that's why he's the best. Uh, but like I said, um, you know, your goalie at times gonna have to bail you out. Uh, he just had to do it for a longer period of time than we really wanted to. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> the final two periods, but hey, dubs a dub, dubs a dub. That's fantastic, and uh, you know, well done by the Lightning this past three games. Now they're on the road uh, uh, out west. They got the Golden Knights uh, tomorrow night on a on a late start out in Vegas. So, away we go. More good teams out Ima- there. Yeah, and- imagine if they they take care of business and get six out of six points against New York, Florida, and Vegas. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've already they achieved. Throw the Flyers in there too. You know, yeah. That you know, not that the Flyers are elite, but they're you know they've been holding in the second and third spot all year long. Right, and they've created a cushion you where crushed I don't think them we- seven to nothing. Right, and they've created like a nice little cushion where they don't have to really talk anymore about, you know, are they going to yeah. make the postseason? I think they're fine now. Uh, the Lightning or the Flyers? The Lightning. The Lightning are fine, and it looks like they're on a collision course mm. to, to to face either Boston or, or New York in round one, which would be fun as hell. Yeah, that'll be fun, but uh, I still think there's lots of work to do. They've got, you know, they're only four points ahead of the Red Wings who are tail spinning. I get it. Um, but there's some other teams that could get hot. They've got a, I would say... They've got 15 games left. I'd say they probably have to win at least nine of them. Fair? Yeah, but I mean, I feel like at they've already eight, stolen. Probably I feel like they've not. already stolen these two games, though, that yeah. we probably would have gone and say, eh, they're probably less than a 50% chance they're going to win that game, but yeah. they stole them. So that's what I'm saying. I think they've yeah. given themselves a little bit of a cushion. It was huge. The, this past week has been huge. Um, and by the way, the uh, Florida Gators are taking on Boise State uh, or Colorado, and that'll be Friday in Indy. As the Gators are a seven seed in the NCAA tournament, they've had they've had a great season and a lot more quad one wins. You know, as as uh, yeah, we've been well, one of the more in the brutal in, one of the more brutal injuries I've ever seen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, they're they're going to be handicapped heading into the tournament. Wait a minute, they have a key injury. Are they allowed to get in the postseason? Is this football or basketball? Anyway. Um, we'll take a break. We'll come back on the other side. Sal Palantonio is going to join us, ESPN senior NFL reporter, big friend of the show. Uh, we're going to talk all about Devin White, the NFL free agency, what the Bucks have done because they're getting totally disrespected again. So Sal Pal joins us next. We're brought to you by the Jeeves Law Group, J-E-E-V-E-S Law Group.com. They are local, they are trusted, and they get results. Uh, that's their motto, and you should trust them because they do get results, and they are local. That's why they say that. Uh, and you, you can go with a bigger firm that's based somewhere else. I would say go to the guy that does things in the community here, has been in the community here for over 30 years, is well-known, well-trusted, and will get the job done. That's the Jeeves Law Group, Scott Jeeves, J-E-E-V-E-S, lawgroup.com. Back in three with Sal Palantonio. Stay with us. JP here for my friends at your local Synovus Bank, and I do mean friends, and I do mean local. One of the local managers in Tampa is John Acosta, big fan of the show, and I've known him for over 40 years. He's been in local banking since 1983. You talk about developing relationships, you don't stick around for that long unless you're doing things the right way and have a great reputation, and that's the focus company-wide at Synovus. Big enough to handle any complex international transaction, but small enough to answer the phone when you have an urgent question about your business or personal account. And for personal accounts, they have a very easy app that works great. You can do everything online. And for large or small businesses, you will get that personal touch and services to help build your business, taking your dreams and aspirations from the whiteboard to reality. 
We can make that happen. Let us show you how. For a get acquainted meeting to open a business or personal account, just call John or go to synovus.com to find out where your local branch is. Everyone knows Italiano Insurance is your go-to for home insurance, but they also have an amazing team that focuses on business insurance. Yes, your business is most likely your biggest asset, so make sure you have the right coverage at the most competitive price. And if you started a side hustle recently, don't forget you need business insurance because if you get sued in this over-litigious society we live in, you could lose all your personal wealth. So get that business insurance. And for the best customer service, always choose Italiano. My representative, Charity, is amazing. I called her late on a Friday because my insurance was going to lapse. She stayed late until the job was done. You just don't find that anymore. Give them a call, 813-877-7799. That's 813-877-7799. Italiano Insurance. JP here for the Geddes Gordon Real Estate Group and our good friend Jane Geddes. Folks, simply put, there is nobody like Jane. Jane is a former LPGA two-time major championship winner. She was also vice president of talent relations at WWE. She also has a law degree from Stetson. So if Jane can drain a 10-footer to win the U.S. Open and stare down Hulk Hogan in the boardroom, you want Jane on your real estate team to not only negotiate the best deal, but find you the perfect home or investment property. And when you work with the Geddes Gordon Group, you become part of the real estate family and get concierge services that include expertly staging, marketing, and preparing your home for sale. Advice on golf properties. Hey, you might even get some golf tips. Many of their clients become friends long after the sale or purchase is completed. It's all part of the deal. So if you're looking for that perfect home or investment property or trying to get top dollar for your home, go with Jane Geddes and the Geddes Gordon Group because there's nobody like Jane. Call 813-485-6808 or go to geddesgordon.kw.com. That's G-E-D-D-E-S gordon.kw.com or call 813-485-6808. Let's go. Right now. Back to the show on Fan Stream Sports. All right, welcome back to the J.P. Peterson Show. As we roll on here on this Monday, it's been a hell of a week of free agency for the NFL. I can't remember when so many big names traded teams to rival teams. Um, just, Just big news. Every two minutes, it seemed like, especially in the early part of the week. To untangle it all, we bring in the man, the senior reporter, award-winning journalist at ESPN, friend of the show, the great Sal Pal Antonio. What's up, Sal Pal? How are you? Big friend of the JP show. Big friend. Make sure you say big friend, brother. How you doing? (laughs) We're fantastic, man. We're we're giddy here. You know, nobody, nobody else seems to be giddy, but we brought all our family home. We're, you know, we getting uh, the band back together. We're going to have another boat parade here soon. You know, we're, we're, we're happy, but everybody thinks, you know, getting Kirk Cousins has completely changed the NFC South. And it's, you know, we're just handing the trophy to the Atlanta Falcons. Not so fast, my friend. Not so, you know, continuity wins in this league. And that's what the Bucks went for. And I think they got it. That's my take. What do you think? Well, that's, that's a good take. You know, my view on Kirk Cousins is great player. Great teammate, uh, very poor postseason player. That's Mm -hmm. established. He only has one playoff win, and he has two regular season ties. So he's got more regular season ties than he has playoff (laughs) wins. That's That's hard to do. No, no. Yeah, that's hard to beat that. But, you know, here's the thing about Kirk Cousins is a couple things. First, he's coming off a major leg foot injury. Achilles is not not easy to come back from, especially if you're going to be playing on that unforgiving carpet in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a very important aspect of what we're going to do when we examine whether Kirk Cousins can really bring a division title. Two, you know, Todd Bowles getting the band back together in Tampa is a good thing. Yeah, I think I do. I I really do. I mean, to me, Tampa will remain the favorite to go to the postseason from that division for the next two, three years. Bowles and Baker. That's what I like about the football team right now. I I agree with you. And I think um, there I guess there's just a kind of a bias towards 
the shiny new toys, right? Um, because when when one player moves to another place, you know, Saquon goes to the Eagles, that feels like a great deal. Well, the Eagles had a pretty good running game last year, last time I checked with DeAndre Swift. So how much difference does it really make? Um, with the with the Bucks, you're building. Like this is even though they have a new offensive coordinator, we talked to Liam Cohen the other day, and, and everything is going to be pretty similar. But what you what 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 you really get is you know, the reps that you've had with Mike Evans, the reps that you've had with Chris Godwin, the reps with Kate Otten and Rashad White. Talk about how important that part of it is in terms of, of team chemistry with getting Baker and Mike back. Well, first of all, Liam Cohen is a super smart guy, and he has uh, got a Ph.D. in that offensive system. Mm -hmm. Second of all, Baker Mayfield takes the coaching – as well as any quarterback or any player I've ever experienced in a National Football League. Wow. For Baker, the more things stay the same, the more they change. And the more they change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> this guy's exceptionally adaptable human being and player and teammate. And the thing that really resonates for me is he's the teammate of the entire team, offense and defense. When I sat with Todd Bowles after they won, in that playoff game last year against the Philadelphia Eagles, I sat in his office, and you and I talked about it. Mm -hmm. He said the one thing that impresses the most about Baker Mayfield to him and the coaching staff is his ability to have conversations with every player on the team that are meaningful, impactful, and important. So that goes a long way. Kirk Cousins is the same kind of player and teammate, for sure, but he's going to a new town and a new system. Baker's got a year under his belt. He hasn't had a year under his belt in a long time. I really want to see how it works for him this year. I really do. I, I'm rooting for him because of how adaptable and resilient he has been in his career. And you want to root for guys like that. Mm -hmm. And Sal, my my biggest takeaway from this entire season for the Buccaneers offseason, and I, I was over there talking to Baker, did a one-on-one -on -one with him the other day, talked to Mike. Uh, we, we've talked to all the Jordan Whitehead who's come back and and, and she, even Chase Edmonds and to a man and Jason Light. We talked to, with Jason as well. Here's the deal. It, this is a rare opportunity where I, I see everybody's pulling in the right direction. As I said the other day, the pirate ship is full. The flags are, are downwind, full sail. Everybody's on board and they're going in the right direction and in the same direction. Mike took less money to stay here, in my opinion. I think Baker took less money to stay here, and I think the Cousins contract is proof of that. And that's rare when guys do that, give the hometown discount, to bring everybody back. And look what they've been able to do. Bring back Chase McLaughlin, their perfect kicker. Bring back uh, – go get Jordan Whitehead. Got a couple of guards that will help him. Uh, and obviously uh, uh, Antoine Winfield Jr. So when everybody's pulling in the same direction that way, I think it's rare in the NFL these days. And that's a little bit of magic I see the Buccaneers – Having do you cover the whole league? How often do you see guys taking less money to put the whole band back together? It's very rare, and I think that's the Todd Bowles effect. Yeah, I think that's the Glazer family effect. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the Tampa area effect. You got mm -hmm. a lot of things going for you. You also don't have to pay income tax in Florida, so <laughs> that's a huge win for players on big deals. Everybody knows that. But, you know, the Tampa area is a family-friendly, faith-friendly area that people gravitate to for a lot of reasons. To Todd Bowles, he's, he's not going to scream and yell at you. He's going to try to put you in the best position to be impactful. That's a very important, specific trait that Todd Bowles has that not a lot of coaches do. But I think what you're seeing, JP, if I can expand the lens a little bit, I think what you're seeing in the NFL right now is teams are understanding that players respond better these days to former players who are now coaches. Hmm. Up and down the league. Go to Houston, what D'Amico Ryan did. Go to Detroit, look at what Dan Campbell did. Hmm. These players can speak to these co uh, these coaches can speak to these players in ways that the old school guys could not. And even though Bolsey is a little older, he's a former player, but he early on adopted that methodology. Hmm. That's a very specific and important trait 
that Todd Bowles has that attracts players to play for the Bucks, And then you have an ownership group that's very reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. These guys are not super hands-on. They are not uh, incendiary in the way they work things. They're not highly volatile. <laughs> they look at things from the perspective, okay, is this going to work? And if it is, how does it work both as a team and financially? Excellent I want to ask point. you, I want to ask you about point, the, the one player the Bucks decided not to bring back, and that's Devin White, which we all expected. He goes to Philly. It seems like a one-year uh, prove-it deal. Uh, you're obviously very close to Philadelphia and what goes on up there. How is this, has this move been received, and, and do you think that there's still some, some better football to come from him at this point after some struggles in his last couple years with the Bucks? Well, I'm in the minority on that. I think that Devin White has football left. The question is, how are they going to get it out of them? <laughs> Maybe the incentive is a one-year deal, proven deal. Maybe yeah. there's that. Because I just praised to the high heaven Todd Bowles and his coaching ability and his ability to reach players. And it just didn't happen with Devin White for whatever reason. Maybe Devin felt like he needed to get paid. Maybe that was the biggest motivation for him. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked to him about it. I don't specifically want to speculate regarding that, but he is young. Mm -hmm. He's a former first round pick. He's got flashes of pro bowl ability. Um, the system that he's being put in is a lot different than the bowl system, right? You, you look at Fangio, he's not going to ask his linebackers to go through the A gap and the B gap and go get the quarterback. They're not going to be doing that. They're going to be available for run coverage and over-the-middle pass coverage. He's got two big defensive tackles in Carter and Davis from Georgia mm -hmm. that are going to occupy blockers and allow White to do his job. So there is that aspect that's similar to Tampa. But is the young man motivated? That's the big key. That's the big question mark. And I hope that he is. Because, you know, you, you always want to have players get a second life in the National Football League if it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just the change of scenery in life is good enough. Like, you know, when I have a change of scenery, I go down to Tampa, I get motivated to beat <laughs> JP in tennis. <laughs> and it works for you. If it works that well for Devin, he's going back to the Pro Bowl. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, but, hey, I got to tell your listeners, JP has – He's, he's muscled up, and he's getting – the last couple of times we have played, he has been all over my rear end, big time. <laughs> well, we'll see what we happens some, on Wednesday. We've had, some, we've had some thumpers recently, haven't we, though? <laughs> we have, indeed. I had to bring in the big guns, though, uh, just to finally get a W over you guys. Uh, most people would be embarrassed <laughs> you know, to do so, but not me. <laughs> you know, JP, the <laughs> – the telltale sign is when Sal Fowl starts throwing his racket in frustration. <laughs> I think I, I think I tossed it about six times. You did, you did. But yeah, your your points on Devin are great, and I, and I wish him the best. And I think the best point you made was those big defensive tackles in front of him because that's when he was at his best. When uh, you know when Vita Vea and 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 uh, uh, oh god, brain fart here. Come on, help me, Nick uh, of Super Bowl team Sue. So Vita Vey and Sue were in front of him and the blockers couldn't get to him because Devin can't get off blocks. He just can't. He doesn't know how to shed blocks. He just needs to be able to run free and go hit. Um, and the best thing he does is rush the passer, frankly. Uh, not very good in coverage and not very good in the run game. That's that, what's what we've seen. Now, if Fangio can unlock that in some way, and he's going to be highly motivated to get paid, I think he already thought he had done enough to get paid. So we'll see. I think there's plenty of talent there. It could be a home run for the Eagles if they get him to play the way we know he can play. Um, but our experience has been extremely undisciplined, uncoachable, um, and, you know, it's been kind of a me guy. And he didn't fit the culture here. He did not fit the culture here. And, you know, from what I hear, Sal Pal, you know, now you you can take this uh, with Saquon coming into this locker room. You know, what's going on in the Eagles locker room that made them implode last year? And bringing Devin White into it, I don't think necessarily helps the mix. 
Well, it was an implosion. You're right. It was an epic uh, collapse. And I think there are three major reasons. Uh, one, teams adjusted to the Eagles offensively and defensively, and the Eagles did not adjust, counter-adjust. Specifically on defense, they had a very vanilla defense, and they didn't have uh, the horses. They didn't have the players to do it. They got a little old and slow in their secondary, and they weren't getting out to the passer as well because, you know, quarterbacks had wide receivers open early in the down. And when that happens and you're mm-hmm. not blitzing, JP, you know yeah. that. If you're not Easy blitzing pickings. and you don't have the philosophy to blitz and you're not covering well, you're going to get torched. You're yep. going to get torched by Kyler Murray. <laughs> you're going to get court, torched by Tyrod Taylor. You're going to get torched for sure by Baker Mayfield. Yep. And that's what happened in the last three games. So that's number one. Number two, same thing applies offensively. They got beat because teams adjusted to a very vanilla offense. And the new chief offensive coordinator, Brian Johnson, just wasn't experienced enough uh, to React. incorporate the kinds of changes that they needed. I think that Jalen Hurts also, uh, I'm going to say it, I think he regressed a little bit as a result of that. Not because he wasn't working hard, not because he all of a sudden didn't figure out how to play football. It's just that had a compound effect. And then I think the last thing is, no no, no question about it, um, they were a team that had such high expectations and they got crushed under the weight of it. Now, I wanted to ask you about uh, adjusted fields and that whole fiasco uh, finally coming to an end. Uh, obviously, the Bears are going to zero on Caleb Williams, but for Fields uh, in particular, the Bears, what were your thoughts on what they got back, a six-round pick, and the landing spot in Pittsburgh, which seems favorable if he potentially wants to get on the field as a starter at some point this season? I think Justin Fields has a lot of football left in him, and it's going to be up to Tomlin and the Pittsburgh organization to get the most out of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I've always loved his arm. I mean, he's lacked the accuracy of a drop back passer, but that's okay. He does other things as a dual threat quarterback that are, that are, you know, in my opinion, lethal sometimes. Elite. So, they, and elite. Yes, that's the that's the word I'm looking for, JP. You got it. Yeah. Elite. At least elite at sometimes. I think Chicago gave up on Justin Fields. I don't think Justin Fields gave up on Chicago. And to get him for a sixth-round pick is amazing. Yes. Amazing. The Eagles invested a third-round pick and two late-round picks in 2025 for Kenny Pickett, who, in my view, is not even one-tenth the quarterback right now that Justin Fields is. I agree. He doesn't have have dual-threat ability. Uh, He doesn't stretch the field. He doesn't have a big arm. Justin Fields has a pretty big arm. And the Eagles, you know, Nick Foles was a third-round pick. He won a Super Bowl. Russell Mm -hmm. Wilson was a third-round pick. He won a Super Bowl. And you just gave up a third-round pick for a guy who's been in the league for two years who was unhappy and talked his way out of Pittsburgh and is a 500 quarterback. I don't get it. I think the Eagles way overpaid. Listen. What they should have done is given Chicago a sixth round pick for Fields. Yes. And let Pittsburgh hold on to Kenny Pickett. I don't understand what the Eagles were doing there. <laughs> that was one that was one move that I did not agree with. I, I it boggles my mind. I mean, why I, what, and I think what Pittsburgh is doing, and even by saying he's not going to start this year, is like saying, You you Russell, you teach this guy to be your successor. Like we're that's their plan now. They have a succession plan at quarterback. Russell Wilson this year, teach Justin Fields how to be, you know, maybe not, you know, have his own office in the building, but teach him how to be a, a quarterback as best you can. We'll take the rest. And they have now have the succession plan with for a six round pick. I can't there's I can name 12 organizations, maybe more, that that could could have used Justin Fields for a six round pick. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Uh and if I were the Falcons, why wouldn't the Falcons do that? What if what if what and I understand that would put more pressure on Kirk Cousins I get all that the fan base I get all that but what if Kirk Cousins Achilles doesn't work out what if he doesn't and then you could have had Justin Fields for a fifth round pick sitting behind him 
I thank God the Falcons didn't make that move, but I'm with you, Sal. I think Justin has more, 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 uh, more football in him, and we'll we'll see what happens. Um, what other moves around the league really, really caught your eye in terms of uh, big free agency moves or lack of? Well, the, the biggest things to me that happened, if you want to just talk off of free agency, was the Chiefs finally deciding to pay Chris Jones. Yeah. Anybody who watched the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl against San Francisco, Chris Jones wrecked the fourth quarter for the San Francisco 49ers. Wrecked it. And um, I, I thought that they had to do that, and it was a really smart move. And that will really, in my view, keep Kansas City in the Super Bowl conversation in the AFC for the next two or three years. If you've got a healthy Patrick Mahomes, a healthy uh, Travis Kelsey, and a healthy Chris Jones, and you've got those coaches in Andy Reid and Steve Spagnuolo, you're always going to be right there, right there. And that puts a lot of pressure on Buffalo and Cincinnati and certainly the Baltimore Ravens. I think the Baltimore Ravens, you know, finally getting a running back and deciding, okay, huh, we're going to have to run the ball with Lamar Jackson. We can't ask him to drop back 52 times. <laughs> you know, if they had if they had a running game yep. against Kansas City at home, then in the Super Bowl. I agree. I agree. And, and once again, Chris Jones stays home. It, it, it's Signing your own players is as big a free agent move as you can do, and I think the the Bucks proved that as well. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I know, like every time, like the Cowboys make headlines and everything, a lot of people roll their eyes. But you know, <laughs> sometimes you know Jerry kind of opens himself up for it, and I believe he was the one who made the comment a couple months ago. We're going to go all in on 2024, and I know all the Cowboy fans are having a meltdown because how do you define all in? And then free agency comes. Uh, and they've been pretty much inactive towards the entire thing. I mean, what do you make of what's going on over there in Dallas and, and obviously having to to pay Prescott, CD, and Micah Parsons a big, big chunk of their salary cap moving forward? Yeah, well, you know, I always look at the last time a team was on the field. And the last time they were on the field, they got beat up by Jordan Love. Jordan mm -hmm. Love! <laughs> Jordan Love. Yeah. So, you know, changing Dan Quinn out and, you know, putting in Shane Bowen to run your to run your defense is pretty significant in my view. Mm -hmm. You know, all four teams in the NFC East change defensive coordinators. Now, I've been covering the league now 32 years, and I have never seen that mm -hmm. in the NFC East or any division where all four teams change defensive coordinators. That's significant. I think, to me, you make Mike McCarthy a lame duck. You put Dak Prescott on the clock. And you have to decide, is that going to be good enough? You lose Tony Pollard. What is the team going to look like going into the postseason? You would think they're going to win 10 or 11 or 12 games next year just based on the talent level they have. But if they miss the playoffs, if they miss the playoffs, then all in turns into rebuilding. Yeah, that's and that's where they may be heading. Once again, you got a quarterback eating up a quarter of your salary cap, uh, unlike what's happening in Tampa Bay, uh, where they can go out and build around him. Hey, Sal, before you go, uh, perhaps a word on the reason you're coming down here. Uh, the man, uh, an icon in this area, Thomas Dempsey, who – uh, developed Saddlebrook um, and brought the, the tennis world to Tampa Bay with Nick Volateri, uh, Pete Sampras, Jennifer Capriotti, uh, on and on and on. Um, you know, Saddlebrook was a an absolute gem and still is uh, of the area, but it really put uh, Tampa Bay on the tennis map. Uh, he is you know, he has passed now, um, and and what a legacy he left. I know you'd like to say a few words about Mr. Dempsey. Oh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that, JP. Tom Dempsey was 97 years old. Anybody who's anybody in Tampa knows he was a big supporter of the sporting community, built two Arnold Palmer golf courses, brought the Harry Hopman Tennis Center to Saddlebrook. 
turned sleepy Wesley Chapel into a major, major hub of the sports world. He was a big supporter of football. He loved the Tampa Bay Bucks. He had a suite at Raymond James Stadium on the 10-yard line behind the Bucks bench for 20 years. I used to go visit it all the time. Yeah. When uh, when I covered games, I'd disappear for a quarter or two, and my producer would be like, where are you going? I'd say, well, i got to go see a man about a horse, and they wouldn't know where <laughs> I was, and I would be hanging out with Tom Dempsey, and he always would scream at me. When I came in, he'd be, have that window open. He'd say, hey, Sal, we're playing tackle football in America. And I would say, TD, it's a beautiful thing. He was a great man. <laughs> I love that. He, yeah, yeah, we're playing tackle football in America, Sal, Pal. <laughs> and uh, he was a great man who built a great thing. He built an oasis. He built a mecca. Especially, you know, for me, I covered tennis. People don't realize this. Before ESPN got the tennis contract, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, Australian, and Paris, it was basically owned by HBO and NBC. Mm -hmm. And in 1995, when I first got started there, because of my association with tennis at the collegiate level, the ESPN executives sent me over to Wimbledon to plant the ESPN flag. It was me and a couple of producers and we had a set on a golf course across the street. We weren't even allowed on the grounds when we first got there. And I remember going to TD because he had Sampras and then he had the Capriati family there. Yeah. And I said to him, how can you help us build the ESPN brand and make it connected with Wimbledon? And he helped us and we did that. Wow. wow. And uh, yeah, he was instrumental in bringing... Uh, Wimbledon uh, uh, to to ESPN in many ways because of my my presence and my friendship with him. He was a great man. We're gonna we're gonna have services for him later in the week. Um, and uh, you know it's a hard thing. He was like a second dad to me, JP. Yeah. Well, we're sorry for your loss, Sal, pal. But that's a tremendous tribute and a story I had never heard and did not know. And just you know another spoke in the legacy of this this great man um that uh will live on forever you know that's to me that's how men are measured um you know maybe not by the by by the money they put in the bank certainly not but by the legacy they leave and how many lives they've touched and this man is an absolute hall of famer in that realm and uh, he will be missed that's but a man, great you know what jp that's a great idea yeah after this is all over i am going to reach out to the tennis hall of fame in Newport, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and see if we can't get him inducted as someone who was a contributor yes. to, to tennis to tennis in the United States. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, look and at the, you is just there, you, you just plant you yeah you just planted a great idea in my mind. Is there an is there a great American player that did not train at some point at at Saddlebrook? I mean, Courier, you know, the Bryan brothers who owned doubles for you know two decades. Sampras, arguably, you know, top at what was the greatest player of all time, you know, until the big three came along. I mean, Andre Agassi, I know, hub there for a while. Uh, it, the list goes on and on. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great idea, JP. I'm yeah. gonna, if you, if we get that happening, we gotta, we gotta get, we gotta have a, a, a big gathering up there in Newport, Rhode oh. Island. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the wheels in motion. I'm gonna do that. We could spend a summer's day in Newport, Rhode Island. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm in. Absolutely. And what a great, what a great cause. All right, partner. I will see you on Wednesday morning at uh, Palmasia and um, can't wait to, 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 to get a little tennis on. It'll be fun. Thank you for joining us as always. You really appreciate your friendship to the show. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Nick. The great Sal Palantonio right there. One of the big reasons, uh, we were just named as the number six best podcast of two hour podcast. <laughs> I got this this morning, came in my email. Feedspot.com named us as the number six two hour best podcast. How about that? Of the top, they do a top 82 hour podcast list, and we're number six on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the rankings. Moving on up in the world. I, <laughs> I was <laughs> like, wow, good morning, happy Monday, because we get. Great guests like Sal Palantonio um, joining us. So, yeah, we're, we're proud of that. I'm not, I'm really not sure what it means. 
but uh, we'll take it. We'll take it. We have enough people say, uh, well, actually, we don't. We don't have too many detractors, believe it or not. It's uh, in this in this day and age, we do pretty we do pretty well in that department. <laughs> we don't get trashed too often, so that was nice to get the number six spot. Um, and obviously, you're a big part of that, Nick. So we appreciate you and all our listeners out there, our commenters. We really appreciate you guys. All right, we'll take a break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to hear from a uh, somewhat pissed off. Amir Abdurrahim, after his loss in the semifinals at the AAC, um, a message to the bracketologist that um, definitely didn't get uh, didn't get through to the tournament committee. That's for sure, unfortunately. So we'll talk some USF hoops, some Bucks football, and some Rays as well when we come back. Stay with us. JP here for the Jeeves Law Group and my man, Scott Jeeves, who lives right here and has long been a highly respected member of our community. He's a proud sponsor of the Tampa Riverwalk. Jeeves Law Group is also a proud sponsor of our Grand Central District in St. Pete and has neighborhood events throughout the year. He has an office on Central Avenue in St. Pete and one on South Howard in Tampa. You can't get more local than that. So when you need an attorney, are you going to hire some huge firm that advertises all over the state or the one that supports your favorite sports show? It's the Jeeves Law Group. We're local, we're trusted, and we get results. For personal injury and personal attention, call us for a free case evaluation. That's 888-9-JEEVES. That's 888-9-J-E-E-V-E-S. All right, this is for all you guys who don't want to go to the gym and do 5,000 crunches. At Bay Area Modern Medical Center, you can get on the new True Body Machine where you can reduce fat and tone up your muscle. It's like doing 54,000 crunches in just 15 minutes. Define your body as you see fit. True Body offers personalized muscle stimulation that delivers the equivalent of those 54,000 crunches in just 15 minutes. Just Get in touch with them at Bay Area Modern Medical Center, BAMMC.com. Chris Lugo and the team over there will set you up on True Body and get amazing results. Non invasive with comfortable and little to no pain and zero downtime. You can isolate and target those areas that you want to improve and treat multiple areas simultaneously. It's an amazing machine, so check it out at Bay Area Modern Medical Center, BAMMC.com. Did you know Steve Weintraub founded the Gold to Diamond Source over 40 years ago by selling gold-plated sand dollars? And to celebrate, the Gold to Diamond Source is selling gold sand dollar jewelry with the proceeds supporting Julie and Steve Weintraub's foundation, Hands Across the Bay. Yes, in 1984, Steve opened their first location, expanded to nine stores as far as Atlanta, but now they've consolidated all that inventory under one roof, becoming one of the largest family-owned fine jewelry stores in the country. Julie, of course, joined forces with her husband 20 years ago, and they're going to celebrate by offering up the 40% off select jewelry items. Plus, with gold prices near all-time highs, it's the perfect time to trade in your broken or unworn pieces for something new and stunning. Unlock the value in your jewelry box today at the Gold and Diamond Source. It's always one place, and it's always a great place. The Gold and Diamond Source celebrating their 40th anniversary, 3800 Olmerton Road, Always online at thegoldendiamondsource.com. Let's go. Right now. Back to the show on Fan Stream Sports. This is The Strike. 1025 WHPT, HD2, Sarasota, Tampa, St. Pete. All right. Welcome back to the J.P. Peterson Show. And we would like to welcome back Extravaganza Productions as one of our Find sponsors, Extravaganza Productions does all the big productions and the small productions around the Tampa Bay area. The Florida Sports Hall of Fame uh, banquet that we did uh, last year did a fantastic job with that. I've worked them on the Pro Padel League. Uh, huge productions, small productions, whatever you need. Extravaganza Productions is uh, are the folks to do it. My good friend Paul Thomason over there, uh, he's got a tremendous team and a tremendous warehouse full of uh, incredible <laughs> incredible props to use for your party. So if you're doing a, a birthday party or you have a charity event and you, uh, you, you know, the, the venue will say, Oh, you can use our stuff. You can do this, but extravaganza production will give you a free, uh, a free meeting. You come and visit with them. They'll price it out for you. you just tell them what you want to do large or small. They do it all. Just tell them you heard it on the JP show 
and they will they'll hook you up. They are a fantastic group of folks over there. And again, whether it's a small a party that you're doing, a wedding or something, anything where you need audio, visual, or need any type of you know party setup, Extravaganza Productions is definitely the way to go. They do it uh, a fantastic job. So welcome back, Paul Thomason and the great folks at Extravaganza Productions. Just tell them JP sent you. Go to their website, extravaganzaproductions.com, and uh, tell them JP sent you. Get that free uh, that free meeting, and they'll set up your your entire event for you. And that's the way to go. Uh, they'll give you great value as well. All right. Um, so the USF Bulls had a historic season, Nick Geddes. Um, and I I went to the game against FAU, and it was just it was transformative in terms of the environment that was there. And you know, obviously their schedule they only had one quad win, and that was the win over FAU. You look at other teams like Florida, who had I think seven quad one wins because they play in the SEC. That's why they're a number seven seed. Uh, they'll play on Friday in Indianapolis against the Boise State Colorado winner, I believe. So now they're going to be going out into this without their seven foot one center. Um, Mike, how do you say that? Hen- Henlickton? Henlickton? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Uh, Micah. Um, he, got, he went down with a broken leg injury that was. Oof. And that was in the first three minutes in the SEC championship against Auburn. And obviously, um, when you lose a guy like that, it's so key to your defense and your offense. Um, you know, Auburn just steamrolled them on their way to the SEC title. But uh, so it's going to be tough for them to, to kind of switch midstream, but they got a very talented team. Ty Golden, their coach, has done a great job with them. So we'll see how far the Gators can go. Tough when you lose a player of that stature. Uh, in, in, at a moment like this, but they've, they've got some depth on the bench, so we'll see what they do. Yeah, I think Florida's going to be a, even with the injury, I think they're going to be a sneaky team. I think they're, what are they, a seven seed? So yeah, I think they can make some noise, but uh, speaking to USF, I mean, I'm again, I'm wearing my UCF polo today. I'm a UCF grad, so clearly I'm excited, you know, as, as excited as I can be for the NIT. Yeah. I'm excited that this rivalry that should have never gone away yep. is going to come back for one night and one night only. Uh, I hate I hate it for USF. It feels wrong that they're not going to that this game's mm-hmm. going to be played in Orlando. Um, it just does it doesn't sit right with me given the season that USF had and the fact that UCF got in this tournament because Oklahoma declined their bid right to not right. go, which bothers me by the way. I, I I I'm really irritated at some of these teams that are just like, yeah, we're not going to play in the NIT. I think you're robbing your players one more chance yeah. to be a team yeah, and go through that experience. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, but, side, but of course, it gives us UCF uh, and USF for one night. But if you're a USF fan, I, I listen, I understand how the system works. Everybody pays attention to the Ken Palm and the Nets and the Quad Ones and all this stuff. And, of course, US, USF's resume, unfortunately, did not match up there. But... To me, when you go on a 16-game winning streak or whatever it is, you only 15. lose two 15-game yeah. winning streak. You only lose two games in the entire calendar year of 2024, I believe it was. It's like, man, it, it's a gut punch. And I think the thing that really bothers me about it is FAU, not only do they get in the tournament, they're an eight seed. Yeah. FAU is an eight seed. Yeah. That doesn't That's make what sense. bothers me. USF finished well, a game better going, than... Uh... Yeah, I understand, um, but yeah. I mean, anybody can watch that FAU has not been playing great basketball really this entire calendar year, and we saw them play USF. We saw it, and we saw that USF was working them for a majority of that basketball game. They were up game. 25 points in the exactly. second half. Exactly. So I think that's why it probably doesn't sit well with me as somebody who's on the outside because I saw those two teams play, and I feel like head-to-head has to matter at some point, but... It is what it is. Um, was USF, if they got in, were they going to win the tournament? No. Uh, the big teams always win the tournament. That always yeah. happens. UConn just, looks to so me, dominant. Yeah, UConn looks, looks primed to potentially win back-to-back, which would be obviously historic. But, yeah, it sucked for USF. But does it change the fact that this was a, tra- uh, a transformative season, like you said, and they're set up so well for the future? No, it does not. I hope the excitement is still there next year like it was this year. Well, let's listen to Amir Abdurrahim after the loss to UAB uh, in the um, in a game that was just mucked up. Forty-two fou- total fouls in the game. 
Um, no rhythm to the game whatsoever. That, you know, you know, credit UAB. That's what they wanted to do. That's what they needed to do, and it got them a, a W. Um, but this was right after the game. Uh, coaches uh, plea somewhat uh, to get into the tournament. With all due respect, I, I don't know who the bracketologists are. Um, I guess they have a team somewhere sequestered. But what I would say is this. Um, if you want to see what South Florida is all about, if you want to see if we're one of the best 68 teams, put us in one of those first four games. Put, put us against your best team, all right? Put us against your best team. Whoever it is in that first four, come see about us, all right? Because this ain't the same old South Florida, okay? Um, this, this group of guys, they just went 24 and seven, I guess it was in the regular season, um, 16 and two, and we were 73 in a net. Um, and again, this is, I'm saying this not to take anything away from any of the other teams in our conference, but we got just as many quad one wins as in the RPI as, as Florida Atlantic. We got just as many quad twos, just as many quad threes, and I think more quad fours, right? But you don't look at quad fours. But again, last thing I say is this, we're, we're in the NCAA, right? This is the tournament we're talking about getting to. This is supposed to be higher education. What are we teaching our kids by saying, hey, be consistent for two months, be the most consistent you can be, grow, continue to come together, all right? And we won't reward you for that. What are we doing, guys? Like, come on, man. All right, be better. Hmm. Interesting. I love Interesting that. thoughts. I love that love answer. It. Love it. Absolutely love it. It sounded very Mike Norvellish too, didn't it? <laughs> what are we teaching our guys? Um, and it, it's only going to make them more hungry for next year. It really is. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what's happened here. I think USF is still lot. USF is still primed based on what you saw this season to potentially be, you know, the class. I guess next to FAU, depending on what happens with Dusty May, because I know he's been rumored to get some top jobs as well in that conference for the time being. Um, but yeah, I mean, and the other side of it is like you know, USF probably knew they had to win their conference tournament to get in. You know. Um, and the UAB game, it was, was tough. Like you said, and I think Chris Youngbug fouled out with like eight minutes left, which didn't help. Yeah. Um, but it was still a tremendous season. Uh, it was great. Um, I just, I would, I wanted, and for those who don't know, there's a, a preset, uh, schedule as far as who gets the home games, because it makes zero sense that UCF should be hosting. When you look at the two records and look at the atmosphere that's been created at Yingling center. And I, that's just like further insult to injury here. You know, it's like this game, if we're if we're playing UCF at our place, like that's a reward, you know, financially, number one, because you packed the house. And I don't know how they split up the ticket revenue, but, um, you know, it, it certainly would, would behoove USF to have that game at home. Right. No question about it. And, you know, for, for UCF to get it, it's because I guess the top two uh, qualifiers in the Big 12 and some of the other leagues – automatically get home games that's the way it's supposed to work and again as you mentioned oklahoma you know turns down the bid or ucf is not even in right so that's a weird deal um yeah we got it, jim whitehall coming up next um and hopefully he'll be able to explain yeah. maybe what happens after that and, and i was going to say just in general to the tournament like i know it happens more than it should but the mid-majors get disrespected a lot when it comes to the seating like the mountain west was a great conference all year and we got teams like new mexico who some people think are going to make a run to the final four I they, saw were, that, yeah. they were put as an 11 seed. Nevada was a 10 seed. Uh, Indiana State, you want to talk about these net rankings? Indiana State in the net ranking was 29. It was 28. It was 28 Indiana State, and they're not in this tournament. They're that not in this crazy. tournament. I mean, yeah. it's – I don't know. I, I know the big teams are always going to run it. That's why Virginia's in the conference – is in the tournament, clearly, uh, when they probably have no business being there. But, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just unfortunate. Yep. All right, well, let's welcome in the play-by-play -play man for your South Florida Bulls, Jim Lighthall. He was in Fort Worth uh, for the tournament. What's up, Jimmy? How are you? Hey, guys. Good to talk to you again. Yeah. So uh, what, what was the uh, atmosphere like uh, there in, in Fort Worth? And, you know, you, you were with the team. And obviously, they I, I think they probably knew they had to win the tournament to get in after the loss to Tulsa. So what kind of what was the feeling going in and then and how it all went down? Yeah, I guess let's back up to the Tulsa game in the, in the last game of the regular season. Amir Abdul-Rahim, JP, had said kind of privately and publicly that he really wasn't looking at the net rankings. He wasn't thinking about March Madness at that point. They obviously wanted to get in the NCAA tournament, but they weren't talking about that stuff. 
but he did tell us on the postgame show after they lost to Tulsa, came right over and said, we can forget about the at-large. None of that stuff matters anymore. We have to go to Fort Worth and win the tournament. So they knew going in that they were going to have to win the whole thing. Uh, you know, it played out pretty well for USF with SMU yeah. getting beat, Memphis getting beat. But UAB, I just kind of felt this all along. Not saying that I thought USF was going to lose, but I just never liked that matchup. I didn't like it back in Birmingham. I didn't like it in Fort Worth because of how athletic they are, how long they are, how well they rebound, uh, how well they defend. So I just never thought it was a great matchup. And let's face it, you give up 93 points to anybody and you're probably not going to win. So what what was the difference in that game? Um, you know, Nick just mentioned Young Youngblood fouled out early um, and they've done such a great job of coming back late in games. What, what, what was the whole difference in the game, you think? So a couple different things. First of all, points in the paint were huge. Uh, I think it was 22 to four at halftime, UAB. They were pounding the ball down low. The Lindeberg kid, to me, is a pro. I think he might be the most talented player in the league, and I know everybody in Memphis is freaking out, and and USF fans are freaking out with Chris Youngblood and and stuff like that. But I just think he's sensational. He can do everything. He can shoot it good enough. Uh, he can rebound. He can handle the ball. He's a defensive player of the year. He's a problem. Now he didn't kill the Bulls in the game on Saturday. He did in the first meeting against the two. I mm-hmm. thought he was just a real difference maker, protecting the rim, altering shots down low. They pounded the ball inside. The other part was Eric Gaines, who really has never had great games against USF, had a really good game against them. And when he controls the show for them offensively, they're an entirely different team. When he's not involved, when he's not active, uh, they struggle in the half-court set. Um, defensively, he's in passing lanes. He's got a 6'8 wingspan on a kid that's 6'2". Uh, he's just a great defender. And when he's involved, their entire team is involved. And I thought those were the two biggest things. Jim, you think that uh, cause looking at the bracketologist had uh, uh, USF as you know the the last four last four out or first four out? I, I don't know how they phrase it, but they were there. They were right on the bubble, and the, you get the loss to Tulsa. Yeah, that hurts. But then Oregon and NC State, two teams that were not going to get at large bids, steal bids. Could that have cost USF, or was it even not that close? I didn't think they were getting in at all, JP. I just really couldn't get past the net. Uh, you know, the, the computers and the metrics have not liked USF from the get-go. Yeah. When you had four quad one wins at one point during the season and they all get erased because those teams then lost and slipped out of the quad one uh, category, that gotcha. really is what hurt them. And, and when you look at the some of the teams above them, there, there are teams that were 0-5, 1-6, 2-10 in quad one games. So it tells me, as far as the net is concerned, you don't have to win those games. Just you play. just have to play them. Yeah. And and for USF, you know, when they're putting their schedule together back in the spring, nobody's thinking about a yeah. run in March Madness at that point. They're just trying to get to 12, 13, 14 wins. Yes. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start saying, wow, we might have a shot at this. You know, I, I kind of equated it to this flying home on Saturday night. I was just kind of thinking, you know, it, it was such an improbable run all season long. But once you win 15 in a row and you get in that discussion and you're checking Joe Lenardi's bracketology and you're looking at the bubble watch, it's like scratching off on a, on a, on a lottery ticket and you get one number, two numbers, yeah. three, yeah. four, and then you're at five and you're like, holy crap, this might actually happen. <laughs> and then you end with five numbers. It's like yeah. you're still going to the NIT. You're going to the postseason. If you'd have told me on November 2nd when this whole season started yeah. that the Bulls were a lock for the NIT, I'd have hugged you and kissed yeah. you. I would have said, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, but not when you get that close. True. I, I know the NIT is, is sort of the the consolation bracket, but given the way that it fell, and we get to see you know USF versus UCF again, which I think we all would agree we wish was still a yearly thing. I think it's ridiculous what college sports has happened there, but to get that draw, even though it's in Orlando, it has to mean something, though, right? At least you get a chance to go and face your rival again. And it's close to it's still close to USF, even though it's not a home game. So there's some excitement for the fans to hopefully get over there. Yeah, totally agree, Nick. I, I, first of all, I, I'll echo your thoughts. This thing needs to happen every year. It's a lot easier to happen in college basketball, obviously, than it is in college football because the schedules aren't made so far in advance. Um, I like the rivalry. I always have. It's a crazy, nasty environment over there. It's getting that way over here at the Yingling Center because mm-hmm. of the way the SoFlo Rodeo has really adapted to things this season. Um, 
I don't like the way it happened. You know, I, I heard JP saying right there before I came on about how if Oklahoma hadn't turned this th- turned down the invite, UCF wouldn't even be in this thing. Uh, I, I think it's a load of crap the whole way the NIT was set up this year. It's yep. probably not going to be that way next year because of the outcry and, and how disgusting this whole thing is. <laughs> um, but, and let me just say this, with the college football playoff going from 12 to 14, I wouldn't be surprised if we're screaming in a couple of years about the way that thing is yeah, set up yeah. because it's, it's, it's all about to me. I'm going to go on a rant here real quick. Please it's, do. To, it's to me, it's all about the name that's on the front of your Jersey with, with the postseason now because Virginia gets in and Indiana state is left out, which is an absolute joke. If, if you guys saw the video, I don't talk much about women's basketball, but if you saw the video of Columbia getting into the women's basketball tournament as an at large, I saw that. Yeah. That's what that's what the tournament's all about. This the Cinderella story, giving someone a chance. Do you think Virginia had that kind of reaction where they're hugging and crying that they got in? They're not. They're expected to get in. They even if with a bad a bad season, they expected to get in. So to me, you know, the Indiana States, uh, Drake got played their way in, but but teams like that, Princeton probably should have been in the tournament. I'd much rather see those teams get a shot. And I'm not politicking for USF at all. I'm, t- I'm talking about some teams that were above them that yeah. didn't get in. To me, that's March Madness, not seeing the seventh place team in the league that goes 19 and 14. Yeah. And, and in the end, we're going back to the NIT as we come full, full circle. You're looking at Xavier, that's a game under 500 that's in this tournament. That's a joke. That's, they should not be in this tournament. No, no, no. And it's. Unfortunately, it's not just college basketball and football. It's it's everywhere. You know the 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 corporate. You know the big names and corporations. They they win the day. You know yeah. the, the rich the the rich just get richer, and it just it seems very very unfair. Um, well, and, let me and, say this too, JP. I think at some point, we all label the SEC and the Big Ten as the as the biggest culprits to all this. But I think at some point they're going to cannibalize themselves. Yep. Where you know if you start looking at the SEC, if I'm Vanderbilt and Missouri and Arkansas. I'm kind of looking over my shoulder and thinking, am I next? Are they going to run yeah. me out to make yeah. more room for somebody else because I don't bring in enough money? They so I, I just think way. those two leagues are going to cannibalize themselves and it's going to take everything down. But that's yeah. another discussion. Yeah, we can do that after the season um, because that's it, that's going to be a huge uh, talking point for USF. You know, what is their next move? Yeah, and it you know that's how do they piggyback off of this this season and from basketball and football? Um, and, and I'll transition with this question. What's left here? Now you got a you, you got a very winnable game. You already beat UCF. Hmm. If they win this game, can they get a home game or uh, are they going on the road? How how will this work? Yeah, so I'm not honestly I'm not sure because the the fir- the first round games go to those automatic qualifiers from the six power conferences. I haven't seen what happens after that. Now, if tradition tells us anything, those teams are seeded. Uh, USF is not. I would imagine that the Bulls don't get a home game. However, hmm. if VCU ends up beating Villanova, who's also in the same bracket to them, and that would be two road teams that are unseated would play each other, and then it would be up to the NIT kind of the way it used to be. And again, tradition tells us if one team was on the road the week before, then they would traditionally get a home game. But in this situation, you know, the Bulls would need VCU to win, and both teams are on the road, and it would be up to uh, be mm-hmm. up to the NIT, who traditionally has looked at attendance. That's been a big thing. You know, they, yeah. they want – they want good attendance, and obviously the Yingling Center had great attendance at the end yeah, of the year. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you if they gave USF a, a, a home game in the second round, that that's a sellout. That's like that's a no brainer, right? I, I don't know if it'd sell out, but it would I, certainly we'd certainly have five to six thousand people there because there's still a groundswell with this team, and they want to oh, see yeah. more of this team. I want to see no, more I, of this team. I, I think I think that just judging from how the public has reacted to this team. Yeah. I think they would, you know, jump on board and it would kind of be kind of a, a big thank you for the season that you had. You got screwed, but you're back for one more time. Yeah, let's go. I, I think I think it would be a huge success. I, I mean I would want to be there. I would want to be that would be an incredible atmosphere. And uh you know a postseason basketball game that hadn't been many. I don't, have they ever had a postseason basketball game on campus? Yeah, uh, in 2010. In, that, in 2010, yeah, we had one with uh, with Dominic Jones and, and and that. So yeah, you got to go back a while. I remember uh, I remember when I was there as a freshman, the Bulls played Wake Forest, and Muggsy Bogues came up to me at practice, and he <laughs> asked to he asked to trade his shoes for my shoes because uh, my shoes. He asked me, "Are you a size nine? And I said, "Yeah." And uh, he's like, "You want to trade?" I'm like, "I can't. I we wear pony. You wear Puma. I can't." So, yes, there has been a home game uh, at the then Sundo. But, yeah, it, to me, they have an opportunity to go win the whole thing. I mean, I think they're good enough. 
to win the yeah. whole thing, but you got to win the first one, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see what happens in the NIT, but uh, just given the way the season went and I'll even throw, you know, the football team in there too, because of what they did given expectations and what basketball did uh, just in your time of covering this team. Oh, we get, sorry. I thought we lost you there for yep. a second. Just given your time covering this team and this, in, this entire athletics program, I mean, 2023, 2024, I can't think of a time where both were, I guess, humming like this. Uh, just, you, just your thoughts on the way the fan base, the way the student body just took to this, these two teams here over the last few months. Yeah, that's a great point. When you go back to 2012, the football team was doing okay. Basketball team got to the NCAA tournament, but not the, not the fan base like they've had this year. Mm. And when you talk to ADs at any level, high school, college, they'll tell you when you have a good football season, everything else in your athletic department starts to fall into place. Mm. And look at what's happened in the USF athletic department because their football team has been struggling. It just felt like everything else, maybe outside of women's basketball and women's soccer, yeah. has been struggling. So now that football is going and basketball is going, man, they've, they've got to look attractive to another conference. And I'm not saying that the, or the American stinks or, or you, know, you must get out of that, but the way the payouts are going right now in, in sports – you have to get out of that league you because yep. you just you just can't afford to stay in it with the TV money and, and all that. And now with the college football playoff, I saw the payouts, you know, what that's going to be for the SEC and Big Ten. They're going to get, what, 20 to $22 million, and the group of five teams are going to get like 1.8. I mean, how are you supposed to compete with that? You can't. You have to get out of that league. And, and as soon as Florida State decides what they're going to do, then I think all the dominoes will start to fall, and uh, they're going to look pretty attractive to whatever league comes calling. My best guess is FSU goes to the Big Ten and USF goes to the ACC. That's um, exactly what I think. I think Florida State would be a, a perfect fit for the Big Ten. And mm -hmm. listen to this, JP. If, if Florida State felt like they wanted to go to the SEC instead of the Big Ten, that's got to at least get run by Florida, right? Yeah. Now, when, <laughs> when Texas came in and Texas A&M's like, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. We don't want that. You know what the SEC did? Sit down and shut up. You'll get yeah. your check. And they're coming in again. They don't care what's happening internal. They're going to do what what's best for their money line. And so if Florida, who's been in the SEC since 1932, says, absolutely not. We don't want Florida State. The SEC is going to tell them, sit down and shut up. And Florida State's going to come in. So I do. I'm with you. I think they're a better fit for the Big Ten. And then I think maybe uh, the uh, ACC takes USF, whether or not Miami's there or not, if they still need a, a school in the state of Florida. I agree, and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens over the next uh, two to three years. Bottom line is, uh, Michael Kelly, who you know was when when USF got Michael Kelly, I said it that day. I said you could not have found a more uh, better connected, more widely liked and respected athletic director than Michael Kelly. Um, no, did he have some mishaps in terms of some of his first hirings? Yes, yeah, it happens. But as they sit today. He's had two home runs that follow. Um, and With two guys that nobody were yeah. really anticipating that he takes. Yeah. No, and you and the on-campus stadium is huge. Um, it just shows a commitment to other conferences. And then, you, you know, being in the 11th largest TV market doesn't hurt. They are in prime position at an AAU um, academic facility. Yeah. Everything is in line for USF to step up and take the next jump in this next realignment. And Michael Kelly deserves a huge part of that, as does Rhea Law, as does – um, uh, Will Weatherford and Will yeah. Weatherford, yep. that entire yep. group, they've done a great job. You've seen it from the inside, and it's the transformation yep. in the last what four to five years. Facilities, everything has been uh, incredible and, and desperately needed, obviously. yeah, no doubt. And I thought, let's go back to Doug Woolard when he built the baseball stadium and the soccer stadium, and he kind of started the facilities upgrade, the Yingling Center, all that. And now Michael Kelly has taken over from there. Uh, with with the football program, they've always scheduled aggressively. They've always gotten great games against great opponents and beaten a lot of those too. And now we're going to see basketball do the same thing starting next year. Depending on how many kids come back, they could potentially have 14 out of the 15 kids come back. You don't know ever know what college basketball looks like from one year to the next. But they're going to they're going to aggressively schedule just like FAU did this season. And their net's not going to be 78 when we sit here, you know, <laughs> on, on March the 18th, 2025. We're not going to be sitting here talking about that. They're going to be in the 30s because they're going to schedule aggressively. And teams will take their phone calls, whereas yeah. they never did before. I would I would agree with that. 
All right, Jimmy, uh, tell everybody how they can get your content and uh, when, when we can uh, hear the hit, when and where we can hear the game on Tuesday night. Yeah, so Tuesday night will be a 9 o'clock tip. We'll be on air at 8.30 on the TuneIn app. You just uh, go to the TuneIn app. There's a tiny little X in the top right-hand corner where they want you to subscribe. You hit that X, and then you're in for free, and you just search Bulls Unlimited. We'll have a half-hour pregame, and then we'll get rolling at 9 o'clock, and it's going to be a late night in Orlando, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I might try to make my way over there. We'll see if I can uh, get by. Maybe I'll get uh, be your assistant producer down there. Absolutely. Right, come, come say hi. Yep. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Great right, stuff. Thanks, Congrats on a great season. You guys did a great call. Appreciate really it. enjoy your work. Thank you. All right, quick break. When we come back, Bob Herrick, Sports Illustrated Golf Riders, is going to join us. Uh, we got lots to talk about. A crazy finish at the players, the PGA and Liv coming together, and, of course, it's Valspar Week. Lots to talk about with Bob Herrick coming up next. Stay with us. Quick break, three minutes. Stay with us. Hey, it's a great time to buy a house and get a mortgage with American Mortgage Services. Okay, I got your attention now, but JP, rates are at 8%. That's true, but I spoke with our friend Scott Fitzgerald at AMS Tampa, and this is what smart people are doing. Rates peaked at 8% last month, but they've come down, and AMS recently locked some folks in in the high sixes. Prices have also stabilized or dropped in some areas. So if you're going to eventually buy, now is the best time to get the house you want. Fitz will get you the best rate out there, shopping it around to dozens of lenders. And when rates come down in a year or so and the frenzy begins again, prices go bananas again, you will already have the pick of the litter. Then he will refinance you and keep costs at nearly zero because that's what they do at AMS Tampa. You're back at 4% in the house you wanted while others fight the frenzy. Be smart. Stay one step ahead. Email Fitz at scott at amstampa.com, scott at amstampa.com, or call 813-294-7595. Scott Fitzgerald, NMLS 386-722, American Mortgage Services, 1000 North Ashley Drive, Suite 1020, Tampa, Florida. All right, this is for all you guys who don't want to go to the gym and do 5,000 crunches. At Bay Area Modern Medical Center, you can get on the new True Body Machine where you can reduce fat, and tone up your muscle. It's like doing 54,000 crunches in just 15 minutes. Define your body as you see fit. True Body offers personalized muscle stimulation that delivers the equivalent of those 54,000 crunches in just 15 minutes. Just get in touch with them at Bay Area Modern Medical Center, BAMMC.com. Chris Lugo and the team over there will set you up on True Body and get amazing results. Non invasive with comfortable and little to no pain and zero downtime. You can isolate and target those areas that you want to improve and treat multiple areas simultaneously. It's an amazing machine, so check it out at Bay Area Modern Medical Center, BAMMC.com. Everyone knows Italiano Insurance is your go-to for home insurance, but they also have an amazing team that focuses on business insurance. Yes, your business is most likely your biggest asset, so make sure you have the right coverage at the most competitive price. And if you started a side hustle recently, don't forget you need business insurance because if you get sued in this over-litigious society we live in, you could lose all your personal wealth. So get that business insurance. And for the best customer service, always choose Italiano. My representative, Charity, is amazing. I called her late on a Friday because my insurance was going to lapse. She stayed late until the job was done. You just don't find that anymore. Give them a call, 813-877-7799. That's 813-877-7799. Italiano Insurance. Let's go. Right now. Back to the show on Fan Stream Sports. All right, welcome back to the J.P. Peterson Show, brought to you by the great folks at Bay Area Modern Medical Center, BAMMC.com. Get your immune system right, your testosterone right, and uh, Chris Lugo will join us tomorrow on Testosterone Tuesdays. So we'll hear from him. If you got any medical or health questions, bring them to the table, and we will answer them tomorrow on tomorrow's show. All right, I want to welcome in our good friend Bob Herrig from Sports Illustrated. Just uh, coming back from the Players' Championship, uh, what a finish it was there. Lots to talk about in the world of golf. Bob, how you doing, buddy? Doing well, thank you. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, man, thanks for uh, for taking the time. Um, what a uh, what, what a scene at the Players' that that was as good a finish as I can ever remember, you know, you had what four, five guys uh, within a couple of strokes coming down to that theater in the, in the, uh, 
in the round there at, at TPC Sawgrass. That was just incredible. Uh, uh, tell me, tell me what you saw, what, what are the indelible images that you'll remember from that finish yesterday as Scotty Scheffler wins it? Yeah, look, um, I think golf kind of needed that a little bit. Um, yes. You know, it's been, there's just so much, you know, tumultuousness in the game right now. Oh, we lost them. Lost your signal there, Bob. Well, all right, we'll try to reestablish with Bob here. Uh, it's probably going to go in and out. Uh, he's been kind enough to stop at the side of the road to to give us an interview here on his way back. Um, if you can still hear me, Bob, uh, disconnect and try, try try to hook up again. Just go out and go back in. Um, I'll text him as well. Uh, uh, they heard a, a little bit there. Uh, uh, all right. Um, uh, starting to get a little bit better. <laughs> we're 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 Sorry. getting hotter. We're getting getting hotter, okay. getting hotter. A little bit better. You there? Modern. This is our modern uh, modern day technology at its finest. Uh, let me see. If I can reach him on text. Um, as you can recall, go ahead and give them a, a little play by play of the end that they if they missed it, Nick. While I do this. Yeah, the uh, of you mean the end of the players, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where it was, uh, it was coming down to the last hole, obviously, and it was Scheffler, Schauffele, Harmon, and Wyndham Clark, and uh, Scheffler was twenty under. The other three were nineteen under. We went into eighteen, and Harmon had what looked to be what like a ten footer, kind of. Yeah. Uh, and he just kind of yeah. it just kind of went by the wayside there, just narrowly missed it, um, and then. Shoffley had to hit from the pine straw, I believe, yep. on 18. Yeah, he kind of bailed out a little bit to the right on his drive. You know, when Scheffler steps up to the 18th, he hits that that nice little – actually, I think he hit a draw on that point. He normally hits a, a power fade, right. but he just hit was, a bomb. Yeah, and if he hit it like eight feet to the left, it probably would have caught that ridge and come down. Well, about and a he foot, maybe, had, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he would have had a much more competitive putt. Yeah. Uh, gave it a good ride, but just not close enough. And then Wyndham Clark, the heartbreak, the heartbreak. Oh my god! Tire. Oh, maybe just game. a little bit too much pace on the putt, but it just it, right. I mean, that thing literally went in and out. I mean, right. it was it, it, he was he was already celebrating. It was it All was right. a it's a great putt, but just heartbreak let's, for him. Let's see if we could try Bob again since he joined. in. Bob, are you there? Bob Herrick, are you there? We can see you, but we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Check it one more time. Are you there, Bob? An audio check? Nope. All right, we'll we'll scrub this. We'll try to get uh, Bob on tomorrow. Um, um, he's got a, a great book on, on Tiger, by the way, that we wanted to talk about. Uh, so we will join with him tomorrow. Mm, sorry, we're producing on the on the fly here, but um, it's part of the game. It's part of the game. You got to have connection to to make these things work. But uh, yeah, and so we got and we got Valspar coming up, so we'll we'll be able to talk more about this tomorrow. Um, yeah, so it it was, and uh, the one thing we did hear from Bob was golf needed this, and I I would agree with that. Golf desperately needed because you think last week, you know, the owner Palmer had a great field, right? It was a signature event, but Scotty Scheffler just it was a runaway. It made it boring. There was nothing there. Yeah, um, I would just say too the, the players. I don't know how you feel about this, but I think other than the Masters, I feel like the players is the most entertaining, you know, fun TV product, whatever you want to call it. I think that there is in golf. Like, I know we have, you know, the U.S. Open, you know, the Open sometimes, like when it's at a place like St. Andrews probably ranks up there. But just like of the ones they go to every single year, the courses, TPC, yeah. the players, I think it's like, I mean, don't they call it like the fifth major anyway? It just yeah. feels like a big deal. You always get a great field, uh, even with the way things are split. Um, so I, I just, that's a tournament I definitely want to get out to next year. I've already put it on my calendar. Yeah, uh, I haven't year. been in a while. I haven't been I, in a long time. I, it's, it's the one great, I've never been great. The one I've never been to, but you know, and it's a fantastic lead into what you're going to see at the Valspar this week, which has a really good field. I think we were always concerned about the field going oh, yeah. forward for some of these tournaments, but 
this seems like one of the stronger Valspar fields that we've seen in years. I think you probably would have to agree with that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and we can run through some of them here as well. Um, Justin Thomas is coming. Uh, and, and for this not being the signature event, I'll just go ahead and say it. This is the best non-signature event field of the year. Um, and and I, I probably by the end of the year, I, w- that, w- that will remain. Uh, Patrick Cantlay is the only person that withdrew that was in the top 10 uh, or top 50. So Patrick Cantlay withdrew. Which it but, sounds like there wasn't there. I think there was a report the other day that he's going to be, he has a meeting set up with uh, the PIF. Probably. Yeah. So, and I'll get to that in just a second as well. Uh, Jordan Spieth, number 14 in the world rankings, the 2015 champ will be here. Sam Burns, number 20, who won in 21 and 22. Cam Young, one of the great young stars, will make his Valspar debut. He's, he's number 23 in the world. Number 24, Justin Thomas. Uh, number 25, Nick Taylor uh, will be here as well. Taylor Moore, 2023 champion. Adam Hadwin, the 2017 champion. Luke Donald and Gary Woodland, a major champion, will be here. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Tony Finau, Sanjay M, Matt Kuchar, Robert McIntyre, and Bob, Billy Horschel uh, will also be there. So um, today they have the Pro, Pro, Pro Celebrity Pro-Am Tea Times uh luke donald we're playing with baker mayfield um who else uh uh ronnie barber of course will be playing Derek brooks warren sapp uh kyle trask jake camarda uh titus o'neill roger clemens Corey kluber gary sheffield jr ramirez so um i do not believe big host of names there yeah i don't believe it's open to the public though so don't be going out there or if you do you know don't tell them you heard it here (laughs) So I don't know if this says in this in this um because last year it was not open to the public. Um and they'll have some it's also Monday qualifying, and um so we might get some other names in there. Jackson Suber from uh Palmacia and South Tampa Plant High School, who played on a sponsor's exemption last year, will be trying to Monday qualify. He's currently on the Corn Ferry tour. Um, so we'll see if uh, he gets in. I don't know where the qualifier is. They normally they have it nearby at Innisbrook. Uh, I'm not sure what course they're having it at, but uh, maybe Old Memorial. We'll see, and we'll get that uh, information to you when we can. But the other uh, big news in golf is the um, the the Live Tour and more more um, appropriately the PIF Fund. Uh, which, by the way, um, this hat I'm wearing here, Aramco. Uh, the PIF fund, that's the Saudi money that runs the um, runs the live tour. You know, there's and you may have heard Rory talk about this yesterday after Bob Herrig asked the question. I was watching this on Golf Channel. Um, they haven't really met with the money people. OK, Yasser al Rumayan is the head of the PIF fund, the public investment fund that basically has funded live golf and Greg Norman and. For a long time, there's been a feeling, especially from Rory McIlroy, that the folks that were running Live Golf were uh, the problem. It wasn't the fact that Piff wanted to bring the money in. It was the fact that Greg Norman and his lifelong desire to destroy the PGA Tour because he never thought the players were getting their due, uh, finally got somebody with enough money to back it. And much of what he was doing was disruptive. In fact, um, uh, McElroy said, let me see if I get the quote here. Um, he said, the public, uh, he's, uh, Yasser Al Ramayan, the governor of the public investment fund, wants to be productive in golf, while Greg Norman and others involved in, in that live golf are disruptive. Um, Patrick Crantley said, I, I doubt we will get anything substantive in the first meeting, but it's great that they're going to actually meet with uh, Al Ramayan. Um, McElroy met with him last year at the DP World Tour Championship in Dubai. In fact, he said on a British soccer podcast at the start of the year that he had a part in the PGA Tour meeting with Piff in the first place, which led to the stunning June 6 announcements of a proposed partnership. So to kind of break it down for you guys, you know, when Piff Money and Liv came in and upset the uh, apple cart, um, to me it was all about Greg Norman versus the PGA Tour. And that's right. kind of what it what happened. And that's why everything got so nasty. 
That's why the PGA Tour looked at it as an, uh, an ex- existential threat to the PGA Tour as well. They should because they were taking their best players and stealing them. And, and the, the PIF fund basically has so much money, they don't have to run a business. That doesn't have to be profitable. And meanwhile, the PGA Tour is just like, well, how can we survive? We're trying to run you know, a profitable business or at least one that you know, doesn't go into the red and we can still give money to charity. So there's two very different agendas here. The players are kind of caught in the middle and say, we just want to make as much money as we can, right? That's that's where we're at. And you know, of course, they want to give the money to charity as well and keep that whole structure. But it's hard to do both, to be quite frank. So this is what this big disconnect has, has been. And I think what, what will be productive is if our Mayan will understand that it's going to be better for everybody to come together instead of Greg Norman who's kind of led them down a path of, of blowing up the PGA tour. And that's not good for anybody. So I think there's, there's room for something really good to happen here. This will be all the productive groups coming together. And, you know, Greg Norman is going to be hopefully put to the side and bring everybody back together so we can have all the best players playing in most of the biggest tournaments. Now, as um, we talked about last week with Ward Clayton, who uh, is, is a golf journalist and also uh, very close to the um, uh, the Masters uh, website. He runs the Masters website, very learned in all of this. He's, you know, he talked about that. He said, you know, everybody kind of needs to come together as one, and this this is a more promising way to do that. Getting, you know, getting Greg Norman out of the mix and bringing everybody together because there's enough money for everybody, and right. that that will hopefully, but it might squeeze out some of the lesser events like you know maybe the Valspar that is not the signature event uh, you know again Valspar has done a tremendous job and I don't think they're getting their due but if it comes to you know one of these things the same thing is happening in college football the haves and have nots yeah you know it's going to eventually there's going to be a demarcation line and you know you, your football team want you know USF wants to be included in those major teams right I'm not sure if they will even if they move to the ACC the Valspar wants to be included in those signature events. So they're kind of be on the cusp. They're putting their best foot forward. They're going to have another sellout this week. Um, that tremendous field, as, as good as we've seen from any of these other events. So they're doing their best. But I think as a golf fan, the bottom line is this meeting this week, it could be extremely productive in bringing everybody together. And right. Let's hope. And, and even if they get a deal done, the the main thing here that I've I've been able to read is that this is still going to take some time after it. I was reading the ESPN article, which was really thorough from Mark Schlaubach, and uh, it sounds like even if a deal is struck soon today, tomorrow, whatever, um, at the earliest, it might not take into effect until late twenty twenty five or twenty twenty six because Liv is still going to have to finish out this season, and most likely they're going to play next season as well. So even if the deal gets done, it sounds like this is not going to. We might not be up to normal running until 2026 mm-hmm. is probably the way you have to put at it. So uh, that's a little bit unfortunate. I mean, you obviously wish that we could just come to a deal and we all could just merge together right away. But obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of variables at hand, money being one of them. And, you know, I'm sure power constructs as well here of how this is all going to pan out. So it's going to take some time. Also, it be Greg or uh, Greg Monahan's mentioned you know, Jay Monahan's mentioned some like punishment potentially for some of these players. Um, what's that going to look like? Do we want to punish players? You know, if we're trying to get everybody back together and just get back to normal, is it worth doing punishments doesn't, and things like that? Doesn't make sense. I think it's just petty at that point. Um, I think you, what you do is you reward the guys who stayed in some monetary way. Don't punish right, the, guys the guys because the guys who got the live money anyway are, are obviously well compensated anyway. It wouldn't right, matter. Right. I don't think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you look at the ratings too. By the way, they are taking a hit. It was a thirty percent de- decrease this year at Bay Hill. Um, Bay Hill, think about That's that. That's significant. With That's the world number one player dominating on your TV screen. Yeah, and it was a thirty percent decrease. That's significant. Yeah, that's significant. So obviously, that's. I don't think Jay Monahan wants that. I don't think the sponsors want that. Uh, you know, the second it starts to affect their bottom line, and I think you're starting to see that happen now as Live mm-hmm. continues to get a stronger field. Um, I think that's going to push, for hopefully, for some urgency to get something done. And Tiger being there, I think, is a big deal. I think Tiger has to be there in these negotiations. And I'm oh, glad he's, to yeah, see he's that on the player board. He's going to be. Yeah, 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 he's on the player board. 
Um, and there's a lot of other things going on in golf. Tiger has his own tour that got delayed a year, the indoor tour thing. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in golf. And what we don't want is it to be fraction fractionalized, right? And 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 divvied up. Um, we want to, you know, we want the best players coming together as, as often as they can. That's what the fans want. But unfortunately, you know, money, money rules the world, right? Money hey, let's power. take one more break break when we come back. A quick three minute break. Um, I got some college football notes, Florida State starting there, DJ Ule Angalele era. Um, some some more buck stuff that we uh, happened over the weekend, and Josh Lowe is hurt again for the Rays. A little bit of stadium update. So all that when we come back here to the J.P. Peterson Show. Stay with us. J.P. here for the Jeeves Law Group and my man, Scott Jeeves. If you're going to hire an attorney, do you want some guy looking for a quick settlement and a quick buck, or do you want an attorney with some chops? Scott is a board-certified civil trial lawyer and a certified circuit court mediator. Been practicing in the Tampa Bay area for over 30 years. He is a peer-reviewed AV preeminent rated civil trial lawyer. They just don't hand out those classifications. He's been the lead class action counsel on many complex consumer protection cases and has handled hundreds of serious personal injury cases. He's dedicated his career to protecting injured victims and is committed to vigorously representing you. We're local, we're trusted, and we get results. Personal injury and personal attention. Call for a free case evaluation. That's 888-9-JEEVES. That's 888-9-J-E-E-V-E-S. The Jeeves Law Group. JP here for the Geddes Gordon Real Estate Group and our good friend Jane Geddes. Folks, simply put, there is nobody like Jane. Jane is a former LPGA two-time major championship winner. She was also vice president of talent relations at WWE. She also has a law degree from Stetson. So if Jane can drain a 10-footer to win the U.S. Open and stare down Hulk Hogan in the boardroom, you want Jane on your real estate team to not only negotiate the best deal, but find you the perfect home or investment property. And when you work with the Geddes Gordon Group, you become part of the real estate family and get concierge services that include expertly staging, marketing, and preparing your home for sale. Advice on golf properties. Hey, you might even get some golf tips. Many of their clients become friends long after the sale or purchase is completed. It's all part of the deal. So if you're looking for that perfect home or investment property or trying to get top dollar for your home, go with Jane Geddes and the Geddes Gordon Group because there's nobody like Jane. Call 813-485-6808 or go to geddesgordon.kw.com. That's G-E-D-D-E-S, gordon.kw.com, or call 813-485-6808. Everyone knows Italiano Insurance is your go-to for home insurance, but they also have an amazing team that focuses on business insurance. Yes, your business is most likely your biggest asset, so make sure you have the right coverage at the most competitive price. And if you started a side hustle recently, don't forget you need business insurance because if you get sued in this over litigious society we live in, you could lose all your personal wealth. So get that business insurance. And for the best customer service, always choose Italiano. My representative, Charity, is amazing. I called her late on a Friday because my insurance was going to lapse. She stayed late until the job was done. You just don't find that anymore. Give them a call, 813-877-7799. That's 813-877-7799. Italiano Insurance. Let's go. Right now. Back to the show on Fan Stream Sports. All right, welcome back to uh, this Monday show as we uh, wrap it up here with a couple of uh, interesting notes over the weekend. The Bucks signed a couple of guards, veteran guards, Ben Bredesen from the Giants, who started 24 games with them. Uh, Sua Alpeda, I think is how you pronounce that, from the Eagles, who was kind of blocked behind some pretty good offensive linemen. Started 10 of 38 games there, one of the strongest players in the combine when he came out, hitting 39 reps of the 225. So a couple of big burly guards uh, who have grown into their man strength will be joining and, and uh, taking the place of Nick Leverett and Matt Filer on the uh, the roster. So good and, moves. Get some Stinney veterans. Is, big... And Stinney as well. Yeah. So Stinney gone got... wrong? Yeah. Yes, I believe Stinney went too. So that's three players that are out. Two come in. My best guess is they'll fill, they'll fill the next one in the draft. Yeah. Uh, prop maybe at twenty six. We'll see. But yeah, yeah. It doesn't look like they're going to sign a veteran center either. Yeah, um, I, I do like the they did sign a veteran. 
No, that was the Veterans Center, right? Uh, no, I did like the Bryce Hall move though. The, the yeah. corner they got from New York, yeah, uh, who was kind move. of who was kind of blocked behind there. He'll he'll push Zion a little bit, I think. So, I like and of that course move Jordan well. Whitehead getting him back for nine million for two years, nine ten million was was a steal there. So um, I don't think the I don't think the uh, the Bucks are done. There's still some players out there. They still have some money to play with, and they got the draft class coming up. So. Uh, still some some stuff to do for the Buccaneers, but again, as as we heard Sal Palantonio say, he still believes it's the Bucks that are the favorite in the NFC South. When everybody else is going crazy over the Falcons, he still has the Bucks very solidly as, and he said for the next three years, as long as Baker's here. Yeah, so there you go. as long as you get the version of Baker you got last year, I think that's that's what's going to hold it all together. Uh, FSU starts uh, the DJ Uyunglele era, although it's only going to last one year. Um, he's kind of be a, be a bridge to uh, the new guys that they got coming in. Um, last year, of course, we saw uh, in the um, in the in the I guess the the Orange Bowl, the game that we will never really we'll talk of. about. Um, uh, they've got um, and and what is it, Cromwell Hawk, uh, who is their their top ranked recruit that's coming in. Um, he's uh, probably not ready to start. And so I think this is a good bridge for him. And and we'll see what DJ can do in this Mike Norvell offense. He's a big kid, has a cannon of an arm. Um, you know, not so – it's a mixed results at Clemson. Went to Oregon State last year, played pretty well. So I'll be very interested interested to see how they – this this Norvell offense runs. where They've got a, a complete um, group of, of kind of new receivers, but explosive, big, you know, highly recruited guys. Uh, no more Keon Coleman, no more Johnny Wilson, but these new guys coming in are very, very explosive. A- interesting running attack. They've upgraded the offensive line significantly with a couple of uh, SEC transfers. So that FSU offense is going to be very, very interesting. All right, um, Rays, Josh Lowe, hurt again. Uh, this time an oblique injury will not start in the opening day roster. So looks like uh, that opens it up for um, – uh, Palacios to, to play a lot more and maybe even, um, Rosario as well. What are your thoughts on, on, um, Josh Lowe's injury? Yeah. I mean, obviously you'd like to have him at the beginning of the year. Um, hopefully he could build on what he did last year, but that's a position that the, that the Rays have enough depth at. Um, I saw Palacios. I mean, he's got some, he's another guy that's got some hidden power, I think in him. Uh, he, he had a bomb, I think earlier this week in spring training. So, I think maybe this opens up a roster spot for him coming out of the gate. But DeLuca's already down, too, with the, uh, right. the injury. And he's going to be gone for, what, four to six weeks probably? Yeah. So two spots. I think this confirms that Rosario, where I thought maybe he would be a, a guy that would plug in at second base a little bit to get Lau off his feet. I think Rosario might pop into to right field to start the season. I'd probably have to bet at this point. Yeah. Um. So that'll be fine. Um. But yeah, we're getting we're getting uh, really really close here, and they also brought back a familiar face too, and Jake Odorizzi, who I was not yeah. even sure was still playing. <laughs> Me neither. Uh, apologies. So definitely not. Apologies to Jake Odorizzi. I just was not sure of that. But and uh, as we were talking a little bit last week, uh, Colleen Wright had a column over the weekend about the um, this Ray Stadium deal is not you know definitely not a done deal. And it's interesting, they, they, they put it up for comments on Instagram, and like I would say 90% of the comments were negative, like this is the worst deal ever, move them to Tampa, why was this reported as a done deal when it's not a done deal, which is you know one of the things we've been saying a lot, like everybody thinks this is a done deal. And the more and more the numbers come out, the stuff that we've talked about, the $2.4 billion real cost to taxpayers, you know, this is becoming way more public than they thought it would, it's why the Rays are trying to jam the deal through. Um, and I think the, the city council and the county commission are starting to take a hard look at it and say, this is a terrible deal for St. Petersburg. And I think yeah. it's, I don't think it's going to pass. I, I really she, don't. I think she put it out there. I saw, at least I saw the headline she put out on Twitter, Colleen Wright, that is, uh, that it takes five votes from eight members of the St. Pete city council to make the stadium happen. Um, and right now she said there's three open skeptics. There's three no's. So one there's more, three no, no's on one the more no vote is a tie, which would mean no deal. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and the county never commission done it, it's never done it until it's done. Uh, the saga that just will not end. Yep, exactly. So um, as as we predicted, so lots more to do there. 
All right. Uh, great job, Nick Geddes. Thanks to you. And once again, thanks to all you listeners. Sorry we didn't get to a lot of the comments today. Um, but uh, once again, we thank you all. We're named number, the number six podcast, um, uh, two-hour podcast in, in the nation, I think. this Or maybe close. I don't know. I, I got to look more into it. I just got the email this morning. Feedspot.com named this number six out of the, the top 80 to our podcast. So congrats to you. Congrats to all you listeners for making it happen. And we appreciate you guys tremendously. Keep uh, spreading the word and telling everybody about it. This JP Peterson show. It is a, uh, a compilation of a lot of great work by Nick Geddes and Peter Blake and uh, IndyCar Tim and our whole crew. We thank you guys so much for, uh, for each and every day tuning in. Um, we, and our sponsors, of course, our sponsors that make it all happen. We appreciate them so much. We will uh, do it all again tomorrow. Thank you, guys. We'll see you then.